Or you just offered the holy sacrifice for the holy souls using a chalice, which I would like to show to you. You may think it's a chalice like any other, but the date underneath it is 16. 46 or 64? 16. 46. That's right. 46. That's right. So there's a story behind it. 1646. It was put and hidden in the wall, and it was unearthed, I presume, during renovations not that long ago in this church. But it takes me back to a story which I think actually is linked with your. Family of Dominicans, because I left on the grapevine, and something had happened in the house of yours, I believe, where there had been a link with the Pre Reformation, and there was one room in the house, did you hear that? Which was causing a problem. It was something going wrong in that room, and they were trying to heal, as it were, what was there, but there was no reason why it should be <coughs> not right. And it turned out that there was, in the wall precisely, something which would seem quite indifferent, but actually was not at all indifferent. It was a book, a notebook of intentions, mass obligations, which had been put there in a hurry out of fear of people discovering what was going on there. And the souls of the priests could not be free from purgatory until those obligations were satisfied. And so it was, and the room behaved itself. Another happened to a priest who was sitting in his room and he was scared out of his wits by the encounter with the priest who was long dead. And it turned out that the priest from the beyond had been given permission to make himself known because he had to get him to rummage in that room. And he and only he knew where to rummage until precisely a similar book came to light. He too was stuck on the other side until those obligations were satisfied. And so it was. Which brings me to our link with the beyond. We have in canon law something which is both spiritual and juridical. The difference between the present canon law and that of 1917 is that this also reads as a spiritual document, especially in the part which deals with the sanctifying office of the church. Now, the way that we help the holy souls therefore has to be codified. It's a serious obligation once undertaken. And I would like just for your attention to the exact nature in which this should happen, just to get it clear once and for all. In Canon 948, we have this, and remember it. Separate masses are to be applied for the intentions of those for each of whom an offering, even if small, has been made and accepted. Now, don't forget that. One stipend equals one celebration. That's the bottom line. Now, there is then Canon 949. One who is obliged to celebrate and apply us for the intention of those who make an offering is bound by this obligation, even if through no fault of his own, the offering received has been lost. See how strong the obligation is. Goes on then to calculate the number of celebrations if there's just a sum of money given and the number is not stipulated. 
But then, there is this question of what we observe around now. What happens when priests combine stipends in one celebration? It's codified. Now listen, just to get it right. The combination of mass offerings in order to satisfy the intentions with a single mass for a collective intention in inverted commas is the object of the decree mos jugiter optimuit of the congregation of the clergy in 1991, the recent plans, 1991. The topics taken up by the decree are forbidden combination. Article 1. Authorized combination. Article 2. And it goes on. But I just want to explain the Article 1 and Article 2. Priests who transgress the spirit and the letter, that is in the very commas that, of this norm assume the relative moral responsibility if they indistinctly collect offerings for the celebration of masses for particular intentions and combine them in a single offering and without the knowledge of those who have made the offering satisfy them with a single mass celebrated according to an intention which they call collective. However, the text adds in cases in which the people making the offering have been previously explicitly informed and have freely consented to combining their offerings in a single offering, their intentions can be satisfied with a single mass celebrated according to a collective intention. In this case, it is necessary that the place and time for the celebration of this mass, which is not to be more than twice a week, notice, be made known, be made public. Now it goes on that in that case the priest keeps these stipend for one and sends on the rest to the bishop. Do you see the reason? It's obvious. You mustn't make of the holy sacrifice the source of gain. As in the case of a priest who celebrates a second time or a third time in the day, he only hangs on to one stipend. The rest goes to the bishop or is applied according to the bishop's intention, whatever the rule of the diocese is, but you can't keep it. Now that's just a preamble because it's important to get this straight. Because if you're not sure that that's happening, go to the priest who will be sure that it will. And one good way of doing it is to go to the parish priest who knows how to handle it. He will send them on to the missions who are very careful, and then they will be applied properly. It's more risky if one does it sometimes in a sanctuary or in a situation where there are too many intentions for the one celebrant. I can't actually myself take any more offerings for horses because I'm three months behind. That's what happens when people know that you are actually applying one for each. Okay, now with regard to the teaching on the Holy Souls itself, we are in the year of faith. And in that year, we should be going back precisely to the sources. This is the Catechism of the Catholic Church. It's readable, and it also has the advantage of having the apparatus. It gives you the points, and it gives you the references. What you might call the heavy artillery to back it up. And always, it goes back early, showing this continuity in faith. Now, you know that the Second Vatican Council essentially was a pastoral council. Therefore, although issues of dogma were certainly handled, it was always referring, essentially, in its own apparatus, to the council which fixed dogma trained. Because it had to, in reaction against nation errors, Lutheranism, and so on. And these points of Catholic doctrine are not put in any kind of question by a pastoral council. Why? Truth is truth. And when, for instance, the council makes a canon, that is, if so-and-so doesn't admit so-and-so, let him be an that is invoking the 
the guarantee of the Holy Spirit who will not let us burn in matters of faith and dogma. So the truth is there. What the Vatican Council in our time has done is made it applicable in the way it's lived and prayed, essentially. The truth is always the truth. Hence, whatever this priest or that priest, this book or that book says about the beyond, we're not in control of the truth. The truth is the truth. The beyond is the beyond. All we do is bow and listen. Therefore, we know that when it comes to our church, we are not just thinking our own thing. We are listening to the Holy Spirit who has promised to lead us into all truth. Therefore, this is true. Because when the highest authority of the church legislates and gives a definitive statement and expresses its faith, it's the faith of the church. So come to your sources. And this, by the way, is the calm way of handling any discussion when anyone is involved with an argument. Know your source. Appeal to it. Refer to it. Otherwise, they're Protestants. Now, this issue of the beyond is treated very well in the article of the Creed, which says, I believe in life everlasting. As you know, it's divided into different articles. So it's chapter 12, or rather article 12, and it goes into all the levels of the beyond. Now, it first of all also goes into death. What happens at death? The particular judgment. Now, we have in our time something which only 50 years ago we didn't have. We have modern science on our side. Death. Do you know that if you're handling this question with an unbeliever, you've got science on your side? Never lose your calm. Know how to handle also source material on the scientific level. You will find, if you navigate the cybersphere a little, a whole mine of very modern documentaries on what happens at death, scientifically analyzed. Because very many people now, through medical skill, are dying and what? Coming back. NDE. And this is scientifically very, very fine. Because what happens? They have now neutral scientists who are in no way into any side of an argument, have found and have discussed even on the BBC and indicated scientifically that it is the case, that it is now beyond any shadow of doubt that the soul has what? Its own independent, self-sufficient existence, independent of the functioning of the brain. Do you realize the importance of that scientific statement, neutral and verifiable? It indicates that every human being is up against that truth which at death he cannot ever escape. He cannot stop being. So death and the fact, I say the fact, that everyone will go on is something that is equal to every inhabitant of the earth. Something therefore which you can indicate in any conversation because everyone is going to be troubled in some way by this fundamental problem of the human state. of scientific work on YouTube, you will find also a proportion of people who have come back and gone into great detail. Very interesting material. As it happens, 
animals. Just this very day, I was pleasantly surprised by what a friend of mine who has set up my website had put up after yesterday's sermon. He had found a very interesting documentary on what happened to this man. You can't see it, but if you pick up this weekend's Catholic Voice, not the Irish Catholic, but the Catholic Voice, it's a very good Catholic paper, you will find this man, Brother Jose, and I can't pronounce his name very well, it's Maniangat, he would be Indian. He is still around, very much so, now working in America, but as they would say, I've been there. He was there, saw it, and came back. And this is one of many. But reading these, or seeing these, all you've got to do is know that it's there, and it's on sign. Should you ever have to indicate some of the issues with somebody who doesn't believe, never get into an argument. Just indicate where to find the answers. Leave them with a YouTube and that truth. Normally, will do it itself to any open mind. Now, this gentleman was very newly ordained and the man of God. He was in the freshness of the ordination going to celebrate that day, I think it was Sunday, yes, it was actually Divine Mercy Sunday, in April of 1985 in Kerala. He was going to celebrate his second mass that day and it was the weekend of a great Hindu festival. And somebody under intoxication was out of control on the road, and he was on his motorcycle, and poof, off he went in a flash of light into the beyond. They were pronouncing him clinically dead, and he was being put in the wall. He went to the other side. He was greeted by his guardian angel, whom he describes very beautiful, and he's shown rather like the little shepherds of Fatima. He is shown the different areas of the beyond. Now, let's get this straight. God created only glory and bliss. But there was way before we came on track this early fall in the cosmos, the angelic rebellion. So that's the backdrop of our coming on track. Enemy, hatred on the part of the demons. So that's what we're up against. Therefore hell came to be at that point, way before, for him and his angels as the Lord puts it. Therefore, it's the last thing on earth the Saviour would wish is that we should end there too in that terrible company. And Calvary is hell taken on by the Son of God so that we can avoid it. So if we go there, it's not a God who's sending us there, but ourselves choosing. Choosing before the tears of the angels not to accept Calvary. But it's there. And the children of Fatima were shown that it's there. Remember that. So that we could believe. Now, he too was first of all shown that level. And we've got to be aware of it. Because purgatory is precisely the last hope that we have for many. He saw people he knew down there, and he was horrified. He can't say who they are, obviously, but he saw them. And I believe he also saw priests down there. He also saw the reasons why souls were down there, and there's a list, strangely wrong. 
goes into, I just see this list now, it's not written down. Abortion. Homosexuality. Euthanasia. Hatefulness. Unforgiveness. And sacrilege. The angel told me that if they had repented, they would have avoided hell and gone instead to purgatory. I also understood that some people who repent from their sins might be purified on earth through their sufferings. Purgatory anticipated. Never waste your sufferings. This way they can avoid purgatory and go straight to heaven. I was surprised when I saw in hell even priests and bishops, even bishops, some of whom I never expected to see. Many of them were there because they had misled the people with false teaching and bad example. Now that's frightening. Frightening. And by the way, we know that one of the main problems for a priest when it comes to his judgment is the way that he's handled his God at the altar. Because if they did, he knew that he'd have no prayer for them. 
and he too had a short time in purgatory. Would you believe? But we know that. On that, I would recommend to you this book. Actually, Sean referred to her, Maria Silva. She's there now. She had wanted to be a nun, but for health reasons, it didn't work. And she found a vocation as a victim soul for the souls in purgatory. This has gone round the world. It's her interview with your sister Emmanuel, and it's doing that. It's get out, get us out of here. And here we have in this interview basically <coughs> what she learned from being a victim soul for these poor souls. Because she was able to know what was going on and answers would come back, very penetrating and very illuminating. So, if you can get hold of this, I'm sure you can. And actually, I think you can find it on the computer. You mentioned, Sean, it was that website, has it? Yes, uh, the Holy Souls Crusade has a shocking version of the interview with Maria Sima. Right. So the Holy Souls Crusade. If you Google the Holy Souls Crusade, you'll find a short form of this very penetrating interview with Maria Sima. Now, with regard to the particular judgment at which we are sorted immediately which way we're going to go. What happens is this. It's as though at the moment of death, when there is the separation between body and soul, the first feeling of the soul is well-being. Because death is such an accumulation of unbearable pain that the first reaction of the soul is, I'm free. But it doesn't stop there. And that's why some of these NDE, near-death experiences, are misleading. Because many will say it was a wonderful state. But it's because in their case, they only had the initial part of it, that freeing from pain. But it doesn't stop there. The soul then starts to move. First of all, it sees its own self, its body, down. It's hovering there for a while, and off it goes. But it's precisely because it's hovering there for a while that it can hear what's going on. And that's been one of the things that's come out with regard to scientific examination of death. Because there's the case of, for instance, Pat Reynolds, a lady in Australia, who was under very meticulously controlled circumstances on the operating table, put into a state of induced death, so that they could operate an inoperable part of the brain. The only way that was possible was through death. So all her brain movements were recorded and controlled. And therefore, it is complete and irrefutable proof that it was the case that in a state of death, she was hearing what was going on in the operating theatre and was reporting after her death all this that she heard. And there's no way, because she was completely dead, there was no signal at all in her brain for all that operation. Do you see how important it is? So it's true. What these souls see, they see, but it, then they become quite unable to do anything for themselves. Hence the state of these holy souls. They're no longer in command. All they can do is follow their weight. The way that they have gone is the way they are naturally inclined to go. If it's away from God, that's the way they will carry on. If the soul has said fundamentally, the fundamental option we call it, no, no, it will be! However, having said that, there are some consoling lights here. If you read 
become. You will see that God at the last moment does all he possibly can to give one last chance, perhaps sometimes in a comatose state. Because God has horror of one bit of glory getting lost. He's on side with regard to his creatures. So we can't judge. However, God himself stands in awe of his creation and respects its majesty, its dignity, and its capacity to say no. So it can happen, and it does happen. If you are that way inclined, you can read a work which I translated from the French. It's on my website. If you go to the website, into the section media, there you'll find the section miscellaneous. There you'll find the translation downloadable of two works. One is Unfortunately, the words in letter form, which are true because they've looked into everything that was said and were all true, there was no way that could be known except from the soul itself. A soul didn't make it. Therefore, it's a letter from beyond, from down under. A soul, by the way, was reappears in recent times. Have you heard of the exorcism of Emily Rose? Terrible film. Well, it's actually based on truth. It's based on a case in Germany. Annalisa began. And the exorcism went on for a long time. Eventually, the lady girl died. And the frightening thing is that in there, many truths come from down under. Why? Because the demons are involved. And one truth that comes out also is this scary one. That there are some souls, human souls, who because of a fundamental hatred and envy, because they have many gifts, turn themselves into wicked human demons. That's a horrible story. And they sometimes have been appearing in these exorcisms. Judas has come up. Nero has come up. Cain has come up, indicating therefore that he existed as a historical person, the first lost soul. Hitler has come up. And also this person of whom I'm speaking has come up. And this, my friends, is very modern. Because this particular case is very interesting because it describes the last moment, and the last moment of this soul who didn't make it. What happened was this. She was one year married. They had not, she had not wanted any children. She had had a good Catholic formation. But she did not anymore want to go to Mass on a Sunday. One Sunday morning, she felt this prompting in her heart. Maybe you could go one last time. And she had this reaction. No! Let's get this over and done with once and for all. I want nothing more to do with this. And a few minutes later, at the wheel, her husband lost control. This car came whizzing across the horizon, and one word came out of her mouth. It was a German form of Jesus, but it wasn't a prayer, and it wasn't at all a prayer. And she then describes how a searing pain went through all her being, and the lights went out. And then she found, and she describes like this. It says, in the theater, when eventually the lights dim and go out, and the curtains open. That was her death. And she then describes how she found herself. Her soul then became naked before her eyes. And she saw the state that she was in without distraction. And she could only go in the direction of her own weight. That no, she was carrying with her, and she would carry forever. God could not. Tried his best. 
So, as she puts it, the only alternative was flight. Go as far away as possible. And that meant, yes, the company of all those who've done the same thing, including old Nick, who was only pleased to get her into his kingdom. So, the particular judgment, the soul itself does it in a sense. Seeing its state, it can't face glory, it has to go away from it. Do you see how it's not correct to say that God sends people into hell? The soul that has said no can't face God. It will be burned if it went in this direction. It's just a natural consequence. We carry our weight. We carry our baggage. And by the way, we have, in our time, a problem. Because of the incomplete reading of the Diary of St. Faustina, emphasizing only divine mercy, the backdrop is not mentioned, because all through her diary, the whole bipolarity of the equation is there, that mercy only has sense in the context of justice, because we have no right. We are heading for the wrong place, but mercy is on side. But take away the wrong place, and mercy has no sense up in the air. So the particular judgment happens at that point and cannot be changed ever. The Catechism then goes into the question of heaven. Face to face. Do you know that the soul has an angelic orientation and nature? Why? At the moment of starting to be, the Blessed Trinity, who is essential goodness, bless, generosity, and warmth, and is always wanting to share it. Bon est diffusum sui. Goodness is diffuse of itself. Generosity. God, at that point, and that's why procreation is sacred, it involves the Trinity, is obliged to come in to a new being that we're making. And therefore, what does he do? It has nothing to do with the body itself. That soul, in a sense, although it's got to have a body, is directly created by the Blessed Trinity. And it comes from the heart of the Blessed Trinity. And at the moment of being created, God beams his Trinitarian image into that soul and sends it on its way. Go! But come back. So that soul The child knows instinctively that there's a God. He's been there. And so that is the original innocence of our being. If we don't get back there, we are truncated angels and we can't ever hope for what we're made for. So, once eventually purification has happened in this world, for those who suffer much, or is found completely the will of God, or after purgatory in the next, then we are homecoming to the bosom of the Blessed Trinity, where at home we were meant to be, and in good company. And this soul, who went there to heaven, is shown the beauty of that state. He starts off with mentioning a very interesting topic. It's music. Music. And music puts us already here on earth, the angelic sphere. We need the consolation of true beauty. And church is the one place that we should have a right to it. It's always been the experience of Christian worshippers that beauty was part of our Sunday experience. This day, we've got a dear friend who had given me a lot of things I had in the hermitage when I was setting up. And he just died for a cup of tea. 
other day. He was in perfect health. He'd just been to see the family in America, San Francisco. A cup of tea, he put down his head, fell asleep, and woke up in the beyond. But today, it was an example of consolation on every level. No gimmicks, a crucifix placed on the coffin, a Bible placed on the coffin, no footballs, no pranks, nothing coming up, nothing that wasn't sacred, not a word said in a packed church except prayer. And beauty! Beauty which put it also in that atmosphere of going home. We need true beauty. You know that the word music comes from the Greek, the art of the muses. Musike techne. We are in contact with divine power when we're in contact with true harmony. So glory is a consolation on every level and seeing the eyes of our maker. Compare that with what the other place is about. To spend eternity with the fallen angels, with the fallen souls, is bad company. Bad smells, bad noises. All in reverse. Glory is complete bliss, uninterrupted and ever new. In some way, perhaps, in which every day are new discoveries, for God is infinite. The purification of the soul then is discussed in detail in this section of the Catechism as is the way in which we can help them. What I would like to invite you to take care of is the fact that we have in our daily life an arsenal that we need to use. The question of indulgence is is gone into in quite some detail in the teaching of the church. Now let's get this straight. An indulgence works on this level. The Saviour, His Blessed Mother especially, and then all the saints have added over the centuries to the treasury of the church. But the church possesses this treasury and the keys to it. And as a good mummy will help her poor suffering children by applying and drawing on this reservoir. But gives us means of tapping into it. So take them seriously. Now, I'll just give you a few hints. Under Paul VI, the distinction between different types of indulgences was reduced essentially to two categories, penury and partial. Now, to understand how a partial indulgence works and the old language used, it was this. In days gone by, there was a kind of tariff affair that certain big sins had certain penitential disciplines as a consequence. 40 days and so on. Now, to give indulgence way back on that level was to make up for, e.g., 40 days of fasting, by doing something else that the church would apply, would supply. It's a shortcut. Now, that led to a very mathematical way of calculating things. Under Paul VI, it was reduced then that category to partial ones, which means essentially this. You do your good act, which is one of these, which is a whole list of them, and the church will apply in proportion to the merit that you are gaining already, its own. So the exact quantity we don't quite know, but it's happening. With regard to primary ones, it's very serious. I mean, it's potentially very powerful. And the church gives very precise conditions. 
Now listen. Because people aren't aware that on a daily basis they can gain pecuniary indulgence with certain acts. Also applicable to the deceased. And they're very glad of this. Do you know that the stations of the cross, even individually, have attached a pecuniary indulgence? Do you know that half an hour, at least half an hour, of adoration before the Blessed Sacrament in the tabernacle has a pecuniary indulgence? Do you know that half an hour of Lexia Divina, that's meditative reading of Scripture, has a plenary indulgence. Do you know that the rosary said in the family has that indulgence? And so on. But there are conditions, because it's not magical. What are the conditions? Confession, close to it. That's why one needs to go regularly to confession. Because if one goes on, e.g., a fortnightly basis, within that period, all the plenary indulgence is available if one forms in the morning the intention to gain them, are gained. If one lets it go more than 15 days, then one is running dry. One has to come back, and it's a carrot that the good mother church gives us. Keep going to confession. Communion. One goes on the day itself. And, above all, the interior disposition, which is the essence of it. No attachment to sin. Now, it's all to do with the will. Because until that sacrifice of the will is taking place, all the rest is only but cosmetic stuff. And there is in this book, actually, which is actually quite interesting material, there is quite a bit on this. And there's one story in particular which is quite frightening. It is what happened to a person who had just been absolved and died. But apparently, according to this, it's a Jesuit who wrote like some oh, many years ago, Father Schoop, it's a Jesuit, and it's called The Dogma of Hell. It's republished by Tan. But this soul, after absolution, rekindled the fire of vengeance and of forgiveness. Well, actually, it was in his case, I think, impurity. But the point is that the interior disposition was not right. One can't fool God. Confession has to have cohesion and coherence. And don't use confession as a permission to sin. Some people, as it were, have no real intention to stop sinning and get this rubber stamp. It is only fitting 
that the providence and justice of God be seen for what it is. Because our sins are not just private affairs, and people in some way have a right to know the consequences of their acts and the acts of other people. So the last judgment is the sealing, and in some way the publication. The message of the last judgment concludes the Catechism on this section, calls men to conversion while God is still giving them the acceptable time, the day of salvation. It inspires a holy fear of God and commits them to the justice of the kingdom of God. It proclaims the blessed hope of the Lord's return, when he will come to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at in all who believe. So I just conclude. There is this fact that we live in a time when most people aren't fully responsible. The Lord knows that, and he's doing his best to adjust things within the mental sphere in which people are operating. Remember that that's why the more we know, the more we're at risk. I just finished with this little testimony here. The interviewer asks Maya Sima this. There must then be a difference between somebody dying while attempting to save another and someone dying because they were reckless. <coughs> oh yes, she answers. If someone dies and does so merely because they put themselves in a very risky situation, that does not mean that it was his time to die. If the accident happens without any fault of the deceased, then God did call that one home to him. Yet, if there was fault lying with the deceased, then the person himself caused it to happen. I know a young man who died in Vienna on a motorcycle because he was driving too fast beyond the law. He told me later that he had, had he been more careful, God would have given him another 30 years to live. When I asked him whether he had been ready for eternity, he said, no. But that God gives everyone who does not actively scorn him the chance to regret. And this young man did regret everything. So, when asked at the moment of death if the soul does see the light of God, she, asks, she answers, no, not clearly, but enough for the soul to wish to go on toward it. The relative clarity and fullness depend on the condition of the soul at that moment. So, if the Lord were to call us this night, where would we stand? It's important that as one goes to sleep, one makes what is classically called an examination of conscience and makes a good act of contrition. Because sleep is in some way a foretaste of the sleep of death. Never go to sleep without being in a state of grace and peace. And make of your nightly examination of conscience the preparation for your weekly or fortnightly confession, not saying the same things from confession to confession. Make a serious examination of conscience different each time and challenging. Treat each day as it comes to you in the morning as though it were your last. Never presume on tomorrow. One time in Siena, when I was ordained, I was passing the old hospital where St. Catherine used to watch the dead up this dying, and there was a skull there. The skull had been put 
in glass case, looking at the people going by. And it had underneath it a caption in old Italian. What you are, I once was.